conversation over conversion. Where can you be having conversations that align with your values that are going to attract the people that you want to help through the lens of your values? And then if the conversion happens after, great. Let's have a conversation first. Let's see if it's even a match to work together. This also means what podcast do I want to listen to? What podcast do I want to be on? It's all of that going through the lens of values. Welcome back to the Honest Marketing Podcast, where you learn proven strategies to grow your business without selling your soul. I'm your host, Travis Albritton, and today I get to share a phenomenal conversation with one of my business mentors, Rick Mulready. Rick has been in the uh, online marketing space for longer than most of us. Uh, he is a Facebook ads expert, works with high-level uh, creators and entrepreneurs to grow their online business. And within this episode, we cover all all kinds of really important things that are super relevant right now. So we talk about the current state of Facebook ads, what's working and not working within that uh, platform, talk about TikTok, we talk about uh, you know how to really capitalize on the benefit of using scarcity and urgency within offers in your business, but doing it in a way that actually serves the people you're trying to sell to instead of manipulating them into decisions that aren't good for them. Uh, and we also talk about the impact that being in alignment with your business at a values level, how important that is, especially now with your brand and how people are making buying decisions, really being value oriented is becoming much more important than it even has in the recent past. So Rick is a phenomenal, phenomenal entrepreneur with so much to offer. I'm so grateful I was able to sit down and chat with him. Make sure that you stick around to the end of the episode or I'm gonna share my number one practical takeaway from our conversation. Without further ado, Let's dive in. So Rick, you work with a lot of high-performing online entrepreneurs, especially in the education space. And I know that within the Accelerator program, which I was privileged to be a part of for a full year, uh, you're always learning and experimenting with things that are working. And within the group running experiments, on yourself running experience, experiments, what are some of the things that you've seen that have been working recently? Because digital marketing is always changing, but as of like August, September of 2022, what are some of the yeah. bigger trends that you're seeing that are helping businesses and business, own, business owners selling things online really gain traction and get like a positive ROI on uh, their ad spend and their, their marketing budgets? It's funny because it really comes back to, and it's really like, I say it's funny because it really is, but it always comes back to the fundamentals of marketing. You know, I see a lot of quote unquote, really successful businesses, like from a financial perspective. And yet when you dig into the business, they're still not really talking to their exact target customer. Because if you ask them, okay, who is your target person? Who do you want to help? Who are your people? They can say it. They can explain it. But then you look at their marketing and it's not, it's not talking to that person. And it's like, how did you get to where you are without doing that? And so this isn't some groundbreaking thing that's like, oh, this is just working right now. But it really is. I see this literally every week in, you know, talking to people, coaching people. It, the messaging really needs to be honed in and speak directly to the people that you're trying to help. And again, that's something that we like take for granted. You're like, oh yeah, yeah, I'm doing that. But when you really dig, and I dig into it like, oh, these ads over here, for example, why are you attracting, your, your, your ads are performing pretty well, but you're not attracting the exact person that you want to be. So why is that happening? Okay, so we go over, look at the ads and it's like, oh, well, this right here, you're not speaking to, to the person that you really wanna be speaking to. This one over here. So I see that a lot. So regardless of whether it's you know August, September, 2022 or whenever, you've gotta make sure that you are doing that. And because your, your business will, I mean, it sounds funny to even say this because it's so basic, but like your business will thrive a whole lot more quickly when you are actually speaking to your people and solving the problems that they have. 
Another thing that I see working really, really well is the ability to, people want connection. People want to be connected with. So one way to quickly separate yourself as a business owner in, you know, this very crowded space that we all, that we all, you know, live and work in here is the more connection that you can provide, you know, like scalable connection. And we talked about this when you were an accelerator too. The more that you're able to have that type of interaction with your clients, your students, your members, whatever that, you know, whatever your business is like, that's what they're craving. I'm not saying courses don't work. I'm not saying that at all, but what can easily separate you from other people and that works really, really well is how do you have that connection at scale with people? Whether it's getting people, having people in a community and, you know, um, just being able to make the opportunity available to speak with you. You know, and I'm not talking like a $197 offer or something like that, but if you're at like a $1,000 and up, give somebody the opportunity if they want to, to be able to ask you questions. The other thing is launching. <laughs> People, and I'm, again, I'm not saying that launching is bad or anything like that, but number one, people like consumers in the online marketing space, like are so tired of launches. I talk to people every single day. They're like, I'm over launches. I'm over launches. I'm over launches. Do they work? Absolutely. But they're looking for a different experience. And again, connection, like how can you create a launch if you're going to do it where there is connection? maybe doing it within a community and and that sort of thing. And then on the flip side, as a business owner, people, I hear it every day. I'm like, they're like, I'm so done with launching. I'm over launches. And I'm like, I hear you. I was that way a few years ago. And I'm like, I don't want to do any more launches. So what I teach is go ahead and do your launches and promos throughout the year. Don't rely on one or two launches, but then have an evergreen system, if you will, throughout the year also, where if somebody really wants your stuff and it's August and you're like, "Mm, sorry, I don't open up until December. They're like, they're going to go find somebody else. You know, there's also a lot to be said to, and again, this is not groundbreaking or whatever, the whole urgency and scarcity it works like it's from a psychological perspective, people will take action when there's a deadline to do something, but do it with integrity, right? Don't make up some false deadline or something like that. It will drive sales though. You know, um, I have a friend of mine who, you know, you would know who he is recently has launched a, a new program, has launched it a few times And every time they've launched it and they've kind of done it in cycles, right? Because it's a brand new program and they're, you know, they're filling it as they sort of go and it's not a cohort style or anything like that. But every time they've launched it again, I say every time it's like three times the last, I would even, I would even say 24 hours. I would say the last like 18 hours, it goes off the hook. Like people are getting in and people really are they're kind of charged on this on this topic and rightfully so right some people are like oh no urgency no scarcity that is wrong right and then there's other people are like no like i we use this because we want because we know that more people will enroll and so i see both sides the way that i see it on the why i like it if our job is to have an impact in the world and that we know that the biggest impact that we can have is through somebody paying for your offer because then they got skin in the game. Then they have, you know, like I've invested in this, so I'm going to take this more seriously. And if we know that that's when the impact happens and we know that when we create some form of urgency and scarcity, more people are going to do it. Okay. You know, it's like, I see both sides, right? But, but it always, always do it with integrity. Um, another thing that is working really well uh, and I'll come back to ads here in just a second, 
But another thing that's working really well is doing thing. And again, the funny thing is, I, I said, none of this is groundbreaking, right? It's just how can I have that connection with people at scale? So, for example, and this was an idea that one of our accelerators came up with uh, yesterday, the day we're recording this happened yesterday. And they said they, I don't know if it was a Google, are Google Hangouts still a thing? I guess. I, Google Meets? I don't even know. I think it's Meet now. Google yeah. Meet? All right. So they set up a Google Meet, and this person is in the teaching space and creating a resource. So they send out an invite to their, to their audience and say, hey, come watch me put together this resource. So like, just come hang out with me. Like, it's like, you know, it's voyeuristic, if you will. Like, they're just watching over your shoulder, if you, quote unquote. And they get to give real-time feedback into the creation of the resource. And I was like, that is a brilliant idea. And so then my brain goes into, okay, how else could we do that? I'm like, how cool would it be to do that exact same topic or the exact same strategy? Um, not even a strategy. It's just like becoming more accessible, you know? So like, how cool would it be to um, invite people to, hey, I'm gonna put together a podcast episode. You wanna come watch me put it together? Like outline it and so forth. And I can, I'll give you the topic. I'll, you know, I'll let everybody know the topic, you know, and give them a Zoom link, share your screen, and they get to give input on the episode. I'm like, that's amazing. I love it. You know, um, I had somebody else, one of my other members, uh, who just about a week ago did that sort of strategy. However, it was a little bit different where they said, all right, for $97, I will completely audit your ads and your funnel. And five of you, I have five spots. And over the next 60 minutes, I think it was, or whatever, you know, and she sold it right away. And it is live, and they love it because they're watching it live, so they get to learn how that person's brain is working. And so I think that's a really cool idea, and you can take that in a whole bunch of different ways, right? And then finally, again, this is so obvious, but TikTok, I mean – it's eating Facebook and Instagram for lunch. And, you know, I resisted, I'm not a big social media person and I resisted TikTok for forever. And meaning from like, from a consumption standpoint, my wife loves it. And I would just see her laughing in the evening time. I'm like, oh, you're on TikTok again. And she would try to show me something. I'm like, oh, okay, I just don't get it. I don't know what happened, but literally when we're recording this, probably three weeks ago, something clicked and I was like, Oh my God, this is amazing. And I would get, this is the first platform I've ever done or I've ever like consumed content on where I get off and I'm like, I'm in a better mood. I've laughed. I've actually learned something. And I'm like, I go on Instagram and I'm like, ugh, I feel so heavy, you know? <laughs> and so I've taken the first step. I've taken the, all right, I've set my profile. I mean, I had my profile for a long time, but I've like put the picture in, put the description in. Now the next thing, we've got topics ready to go. So I'm going to start, you know, doing that. Do I need to do it for the business? I don't, but it seems I want to be in on the ground floor here. And it's still very much the ground floor. Um, TikTok ads. I know a lot of people, I am not running TikTok ads yet, but I know a lot of people who are, and they're doing really well. It's very, very effective. And I think like it's Facebook 10 years ago, basically, when it was the wild west and there were very few competitors and people are doing really, really well. And so uh, TikTok is where it's at. <laughs> All right. So I want to circle back to a couple of things. That was a lot. <laughs> I, just went off with, great. I just went off with a big tangent there. I wasn't going to stop you either. I was going to let you just keep rolling and just like spill all the beans. Um, so the first thing I want to circle back to is scarcity and urgency because that is something that when used appropriately – can be really powerful, not just for you as a business owner or a marketer, but also for helping incentivize the people you're trying to serve. But I can probably count on one hand or two hands, uh, lots more than that. Lots of examples where I'm like, this isn't real. And the, the biggest giveaway is if you're totally. on a screen with a countdown and you hit refresh and it starts again at the top. It's yeah. like, oh, that's a fake yeah. deadline. 
You just yep. put a little countdown timer on there to make me think I had to do something. Right. So out of integrity. Yeah. Right there. So so yep. so when you're working with your accelerator students and business owners, and they're like, okay, how do I utilize this with honesty, but also make it effective? What's that look like? So first of all, what you want to do in in a launch is you want to give people as much as much of the information as possible, like tell them everything that they need to know. You're not holding back or anything like that. You want to give them as much information as they need to make a decision themselves. Because what you don't want happening is you have that sort of, and I'll give you some examples here in a second, but you have that urgency and scarcity and they're like, I got to do this. And they, they do it and they immediately regret it, you know, or the next day they're like emailing you and they're like, oh, like I just, I got caught up in the moment and all this other stuff, right? And so that, that can still happen even when you're giving somebody all the information. It's just, it's reality, right? But you do want to give people as much information as possible. By the way, just real quick, on that note, I should have meant to, mentioned this earlier, put your price on whatever it is that you're selling. Make it visible. And I haven't done this, we're, we're literally changing it right now, and I haven't done this for Accelerator um, I haven't, I haven't done it up to this point. We're redesigning our page and stuff like that. The price is going on there, right? Currently the price is, it's a 12 month program, 2,500 a month or one payment of 25 K that price may go up. I'm thinking about that. But anyway, the point being is like, I could Google, I, <laughs> I don't Google myself, honestly, Travis, but if I Google Rick Mulready, one of the options that comes up is accelerator price. People are, are searching for that and I'm not giving that information. And what I find and I hear from a lot of people is they're like, yeah, I didn't even apply because I figured working with you would be way too expensive. But then they learn the price and like, and for everything that they get in the program, they're like, holy cow, I wish I'd known that earlier, you know? So anyway, tangent, put your price down there on the page, make it, don't be afraid of it. Um, so integral urgency and scarcity. Actually, if it is an actual deadline, if you have like a cohort style of a launch and you're like, oh, I'm kicking off on, you know, whatever, September 1st, and I only have 20 spots, that's legit. You can have bonuses that expire that are legitimately only available for that specific launch or that you only make available when you do these special promotions. Um, you can do discounts too. But again, you want if you're doing these things, you the integrity part comes in is like, I'm only offering whatever that might be during that time. And you're very, again, you're very clear about that. You're letting people know all the information to be able to make that decision. For example, you could say, you can buy it tomorrow, but you're buying it, you know, at regular price. It'd be like kind of walking into a car dealership and they're having like a, whatever, President's Day sale. And it's like a special price this weekend. But when that sale's over, it goes back up to, you know what I mean? It's like, and it's like coming in in when's President's Day? <laughs> it's a terrible example. Like February, I think it is. Yeah. It's like coming in in June and being like, "Hey, I want that President's Day sale." Right. You're like, "Well, that was four months ago." You know. So those are just examples of within integrity. Out of integrity would be like an example you just said. Like I refresh the page and the the countdown timer just reset itself. <laughs> yep. Or if it goes all the way to zero and then nothing changes on the page, it doesn't like yeah, redirect exactly. you or anything. It's just like, oh, it just it just stopped. Um, yeah. So then, when you're thinking about live launches versus evergreen launches, and when we say launches, if you're not in the info product world, that simply means there's a period of time where you're actively promoting a product or a service or an offering, and then it expires in some way. Like that would be a launch. And there's different ways you can do it, whether it's webinar or like a like a live masterclass or pre-recorded, which would be evergreen, meaning anyone can come in at any point in time. That That's what we mean by launches. How do you apply that to evergreen versus live? Because live, it's it's a lot easier, like you said, with cohort. It's like, well, 
the class starts. It's like if you're enrolling at a course at a college university, it's like, well, this is when the semester starts. Right. If you want to take the class, yep. you got to sign up by here. Here's the deadline. Mm-hmm. And so that makes sense. With Evergreen, is it more like the price stuff? Is it the bonus stuff? And then how do you, what software do you use to track that? Um, is it still yep. a deadline funnel? Is there something else that you've discovered recently? Like, how are you tracking that so that the the experience from the person that's coming into it is legitimate um, yep. and you can actually deliver on, no, this is actually a deadline that's enforced for these reasons in, in, in X, Y, and Z. Totally. Yeah, I mean, of course you can still use deadline funnel. Um, so I use, I've been using now for a year and a half, uh, a tool called, uh, well, it's, they've just rebranded. Uh, it's formerly 10xpro.io mm-hmm. and they rebranded to Click. It's spelled kind of weird, K-L-E-Q.com. Um, <laughs> Very unique. I don't, yeah. I don't know, but hey, but I love it. And I've okay. tried all the platforms, right? Mm-hmm. Like I use Kajabi for years and years and I like, I like Kajabi, but just had some limitations. And so a platform like 10X Pro has all of this built right into it. So like I can have a sales page, for example, that has that, uh, functionality built right into it. Meaning like I can add that functionality to the page where it's like, okay, this offer, this special offer expires on <clears throat> Friday. And if somebody tries to go to that page, then it either redirects to a different page. Maybe it's the exact same page without that special offer that was available. Um, or you can say, you know, to like a wait list or something like that. So, that that tool that platform you know i can i put all my courses in there my all the funnels landing pages dashboards order forms has an affiliate set like does all those things and and more and more of these tools are having that sort of functionality built right into it and they're they are based on different things like the most common ways like ip address for example so that if you you know click on the link and now you're quote unquote timer starts. So if it's, if the, if the offer is available for four days, as soon as you make that first click, okay, your, for, your four days starts at that point. So it's completely doable via Evergreen as well. Perfect. So I want to shift a little bit towards paid ads because uh, yep. in the world of the internet, it's always nice when you can start a little fire and then throw a bunch of jet fuel on top of it to, yes. to accelerate results. And, and that's been the beauty of Facebook ads for so long is you can get started for so cheap. Um, but over the last couple of years, Facebook has seen a dramatic shift in the way their ads have not only been performing, but tracking capabilities and, and even like interest targeting has largely yeah. disappeared. Mm-hmm. So, so kind of what's the current state of Facebook ads? Like if you're yeah. wanting to start a Facebook ads campaign, what are the styles of ads that are working for building custom audiences, lookalike audiences, is it still complete registration? Is this, that still the target? Is it reach through play? Like just kind of break down kind yeah. of the current state of Facebook ads and, and how they can still be useful because, you know, like with every major shift, and I know this is something you preach on often, there's always opportunity, right? There's people sure. that it's like, oh, well, Facebook doesn't work anymore and they completely abandon it and now it becomes, oh, well, this is underpriced now because so many people have shifted to trying to do more Google ads or things like that. Mm -hmm. Um, So yeah, so, so kind of give us a lay the land of what Facebook ads is up to nowadays and what's working. And it's that, what you just described, Travis has kind of happened, Mm -hmm. you know, prices have, have come down a little bit, but they've also, you know, they're on the higher side. Um, Facebook knows it's in a tough spot. The whole iOS update, 14.5 14.5 with the privacy and all that stuff. It really hurt these platforms, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, um, Google, a lot more, I think, than these platforms realized it would. And so Facebook is trying to figure out, you know, that solution. Like, how do we, how do we take it from third-party data, meaning we can't really track very well when somebody clicks on my ad, goes to an external landing page, that I've created an opt-in for a webinar, for example, we, the, the visibility into actual conversions is so much drastically less um, than, it, than it used to be. So Facebook is like, all right, how do we make that a 
more first party data? How can we create that experience within Facebook? And one way they're doing that is with lead ads. So lead ads have been around for years and years and years, and they used to be terrible. Um, but I don't know what they've been doing in the back end, but faith, uh, lead ads have been working quite well. And they have been for a while. So for those people who don't know, like the lead ad is basically when you as the advertiser want to collect an email address, for example, the experience takes place within the ad unit itself. So as a user, if you're scrolling through Instagram or Facebook and you see an ad in your feed and you're like, oh yeah, I want to learn more about that or I want to opt into that, you can click that button, the call to action button, and your information, like your name and your email that's tied to the account is auto-populated. Now you can also set it so that it's not auto-populated. And that is a really good thing now because the reason that lead ads years ago weren't very effective was that it would auto-populate with, you know, the Facebook information, but so many people have like throwaway email addresses at, you know, for their Facebook account that the leads would be cheap, but they would literally and figuratively be cheap, right? It would be a cheap lead cost, but then they were not quality, right? That has really changed. And you've got different options now when you're doing lead ads that they can be really effective for building your email list um, and, and, and so on. And you can also um, connect it to like, depending on how you're doing it with like a webinar, that sort of thing. So lead ads, absolutely. Facebook has changed, you know, it's not conversions anymore. They call it sales now. All that means, it's kind of weird, right? But all that means is if I do want to send people off of Facebook to a landing page, then you're choosing the sales objective. They've reduced the number of objectives and they've made it very uh, sort of clear on, okay, if your objective is to get people to join your email list, then essentially you've got two options, the, the lead ads and the, I want to send people off the ad, off Facebook over to my landing page. And that would be the sales objective. It's a little bit confusing. It is. Um, but just know that when you were sending people off of the platform, you need to like what I like to call triangulate the data. So you're going to take the data that you see in Facebook ad manager that is not going to be super accurate What's going to be accurate that you see in there is, you know, like click through rate and the amount of ad spend and the reach and all that sort of thing. But as far as conversion data, it's not going to be very accurate. So you're going to need to look at like your email CRM. So like, oh, did all these leads, like what's ConvertKit saying or whatever you're using, Active Campaign or whatever? What is my landing page software saying as far as the numbers? And they're never going to match up completely, which is you know, that's always been the case, but it is frustrating. You're trying to make your best guess on what is my cost per lead and how many leads have I actually brought in. So that's when you're sending people from like the, the traditional way off of Facebook, click on the ad, go to my landing page and do that. Um, when you do lead ads, by the way, you will get much more accurate data. And just like you could with, you know, an external like sending people to an external landing page, you can build retargeting audiences with lead ads. Like, so people interacting with your ad, people that clicked on your ad, went to, you know, the little, the field where you enter your name, but they didn't complete the opt-in or registration. And then also you can build an audience of people who actually, who do complete the registration. So that's really cool. And that's all first party quote unquote data, meaning what's you're staying within Facebook. So Facebook can collect that data. Um, so that's on that side on the grander scheme, audience, larger audiences, you know, it used to be years ago where it's like, all right, let's get fairly specific, maybe a couple hundred to a few hundred thousand people. Now we're talking millions in audience size. If, if you can, uh, your targeting ability, just like you said, Travis is not as, you know, you, you were relying more on the AI We're we're relying more on Facebook's algorithm. It is way smarter than we are, but we're relying more on that, the machine learning, if you will, than our trying to specifically target. The way that we're targeting is 
you know, it's a, you can get targeted with interest targeting still. You can still do your custom audiences, meaning input your, you know, bring in your email address or email list and it'll do its matching and create lookalike audiences and all that stuff. Again, those audiences are going to be smaller than they have in the past because people on your email list may have opted out of tracking, right? So Facebook might not be able to, to, tra- uh, to show the ad to people, that sort of thing. Um, and then lookalike audiences, the quality of lookalike audiences has also suffered because of that as well. So yes, you can get targeted still with interest targeting, not as much as you could, you, you know, used to be able to. The idea though is to get as targeted as you can while keeping the audiences as large as you can. I don't mean like hundreds of millions. I'm talking like a 10 million person audience or 5 million person audience, for example. And then once you start to teach the algorithm, the type of people that you're trying to, trying to get in front of, then you can go broad. Like if I said five years ago, all right, Travis, let's, let's target your ads to um, men and women between 25 and 44 in the US go, you would have thought I was crazy. Like, like it's not something we used to do, but now that is a very, like that's part of the strategy is go super broad, be very targeted with your ad creative, meaning your, your, um, your image or your video especially your copy and your headline. And that way you're using the ad creative itself to speak to the people within the broader audience. And then Facebook is trying to find those people, if that makes sense. And so it's a, it's absolutely a, a creative game, if you will, on Facebook, testing different creative. And when I say creative, I'm talking about the ad unit itself, like the image, testing different images, testing different copy, testing different headlines, that sort of thing. Nothing new, but that's become even more important now. Um, so that's kind of like, kind of the state of, of Facebook ads. Um, you know, a lot of people say, oh, they don't work anymore. I can rattle off half a dozen people just in our coaching program. They're crushing it with ads. Um, and here, here is one thing that I've noticed, especially after, I mean, it's been this way for years, but especially after iOS is when you advertise consistently, when you have some form of presence, whether it's a video view campaign, you're just spending a couple dollars a day, or you're consistently list building, you will do better over time because you have that consistency. Facebook's, you know, AI sees that you're consistently advertising and you're collecting, you know, the AI is collecting that data all along so that when you go for a launch, for example, and you're like, I want to ramp up my spend and you've been spending all along, you're going to do better during that launch. Like the days of just like not advertising and then all of a sudden open the floodgates for a launch, if you will, they're gone. Uh, I mean, you can still do it, but you are not going to see the kind of results that you used to see. Um, I think those are the, those are the biggest differences. And, and also TikTok ads, people are, it's wide open on, on TikTok and the people who are in there now, they're, they're doing really well with it. So, so yeah, it seems like a, like a blessing and a curse with Facebook. Now it's like, if you've been used to doing Facebook ads a certain way, it feels like you've lost a certain element of control compared to what, used to be able to do right i want people that follow this person and like this person and live here and speak this and you could create like this multi-layered targeting like persona and be really really specific and so it can feel like a loss that oh i can't do that anymore but if you're just getting started or you've always been overwhelmed by the idea of running a facebook ads that could actually be a very freeing thought that oh i could i can just focus on making a really compelling post that speaks directly to that person that i'm trying to to help with my business. Absolutely. And then yep. like, so the, it seems like the threshold for actually getting started and, and be competing and to create profitable ads, like it's, it's actually a pretty great spot to be in right now. Yeah. I mean, if you're starting now, you don't know what it was like right. <laughs> in the past. So it's like, okay, cool. You're starting with a clean slate. 
And this should go without saying, again, this is one of those fundamental things that you got to have a good offer, whatever it is that you're offering. And when I say offer, I don't necessarily mean like the paid offer, because oftentimes, you know, we're just sending, we're trying to build our list, right? We're trying to get people to register for an event, you know, whether it's a video or a webinar, what have you, that offer, meaning, okay, if I want to send people to a lead magnet to build my list, that's your offer. It better be a really good offer in how you're communicating it for people to want it, obviously. Because if it, like, you can have the best ad, you know, campaign set up and all this other stuff, but if your offer is crap, like, it's not going to do well, you know? So that is, that is first and foremost the number one thing. You have to have an offer. And this obviously comes back to what I said before, knowing your person that you want to be helping. Yep. I'll definitely have to have you back on uh, once you've got some more uh, groundwork laid in your TikTok account and uh, can kind of have like a good contrast between the platforms. Uh, well, right now I have 52 followers right now and I have zero content on there. <laughs> I don't know who they are, but hey, there's 52 followers there. They're waiting. <laughs> They're waiting for my content. Eagerly, yeah. eagerly, waiting for, eagerly a waiting for a dance video from Rick Mulroney. Totally. Yep, it's coming. So <laughs> I also want to shift to... Something that has definitely that both of us have definitely seen in the last couple of years as digital marketing has evolved away from more transactional style marketing, which is mm-hmm. I'm going to interrupt your attention, give you something really juicy, and you're going to buy it, whether you have all the information or not. And then as long as that is making more money than I spend, then I scale it up and scale it up and scale it up. And that yep. kind of became the arbitrage. Yep. Where now your brand the values of your business, your values as an individual are becoming much more important and really at the forefront of buying decisions, right? It's not just about can this product or service do what it's promising, but also is this the kind of company that I want to associate with or that reflects the things that are important to me? Talk about, because I know that you have really made a very specific strategic shift, not strategic in the way that you're like trying to manipulate the marketing to you know, sure. squeeze out a couple extra dollars, but you've made a very intentional shift towards that. And so I'd love for you to just yeah. kind of share your journey for kind of how you came to that decision and then how that has played out and paid off since you've made that shift in your business. So, yeah, I like to say it's, I like to call it uh, conversation over conversion. So where can you be having conversations that align with your values that are going to attract the people that you want to help through the lens of your values. And then if the conversion happens after, great. But it's just like you said, Travis, that you're flipping it from conversion, conversion, conversion to let's have a conversation first. Let's see if this is even a match to work together. And, and I say work together too, and I'll come, sort of come back to this, but I'll mention it now. This also means what podcast do I want to listen to? What podcast do I want to be on? Uh, What people do I want to allow on my podcast? And that could be, you know, if you're doing videos or whatever it might be. It's all of that going through the lens of values. And, you know, this whole journey, I think like a lot of people for me started when, with the the George Floyd shooting. And I stayed really quiet after that. And the reason that I did was because for a long time, I struggled with, and I'm still kind of like this too, where you saw all these people, especially in the online space, right? They knew that people wanted to see who was responding, if you will. And like, sharing their support. But what I saw that was happening in the online space, these quote unquote influencers, that for so many people, it was performative. That it was just like, yeah, look at me. I'm doing this or, you know, I'm having these types of conversations or different guests on the whatever it might be. But it wasn't like nothing was changing at the core. And, you know, For me personally, I know a lot of people personally that where this was happening and I wasn't happy with it. 
And I felt like that's why I kind of stayed quiet because I didn't want to be quote unquote performative about it. Meaning like, look at me, look what I'm doing over here. Whereas I'm the type of person that likes to make change internally first and then go from there. And so it wasn't until really early, um, early 2021 when people started reaching out about Accelerator and they were challenging me on this. Why haven't I, I don't know where you stand on any of this stuff. Why haven't you talked about this? And that was sort of the, the wake up for me, not from a business sense. It was more so people really do want to hear what I have to think about these types of things, which I've always not been super comfortable with because I'm just a regular dude. But I also really don't take that for granted. Like I'm very humbled by, by that. And so I also realized that I didn't know a lot and I had so much to learn and continue to learn. I also knew that it wasn't going to be like, okay, it's, you know, August 1st and I'm good now. You know, I've, so I, I went out and found the, the best diversity, equality, and inclusion consultant that I could find. Her name is Erica Corday. She's amazing. And I started doing work with her. And the very first thing that Erica works through is values. And it really challenged me from the perspective of, because I thought I had values. I had values, but like, they were, I don't know, I kind of felt like for some of them, they were just sort of surface level where I was like, oh yeah, like I, one of the, the number one value in the business and for myself is integrity. And one of the first things I learned was like, okay, that's great, but like, let's take it further. Like, like to, let's really dig into that. And so long story short on that is I worked with Erica and, and um, her business partner, India for a year and a half. And I still, I still work with Erica from time to time and, you know, took my team through trainings and we did a lot of work there. And I think the biggest thing that came out of that was I made a lot of decisions of what I was going to stand for and what I wasn't. And a lot of things that continue to happen in the, the online space I'm not standing for that. I'm not standing for that. So where there may have been a connection in the past or what have you, and I didn't, agree. I'm like, all right, I'm, that is not, that is not, that does not align with my values anymore. Also, we said, okay, the podcast, everything basically is going to go through the lens of our values, everything, the types of guests I have on the podcast, where I go, and speak to another podcast, speak to other masterminds, who I collaborate with, uh, what's, what types of students that I allow in Accelerator, for example. All of that, like what types of tools that we use, everything started going through the lens of the values. And that's the culture I created in the business for my team as well. And that's what I preach to our Accelerator members is one of the big thing, things that I teach. And it just made... Like, I feel so much better about myself, meaning like I'm very clear on this now and I'm not afraid to take a stand, if you will, where I feel it, it's the right thing to do. And that's where it's like conversation over conversion. You know, I've turned away tens of thousands of dollars over the past couple of years because of that. Meaning like, you know what, this doesn't align with me. And so anyway, that's kind of the, the story of the values. And I would encourage everybody listening, if you don't have, like, I'm sure you have values, right? But if you don't operate your business through the lens of values that you set up for your business, do that. <laughs> Take some time to do that. And then, then you're making all of your decisions, hiring decisions, who you're willing to bring on to your team, contractors that you're willing to work with, all of that stuff goes through the lens of your values. And it just, it's, I don't know, I can't really put to words what it does for you, but it's a very freeing experience. Well, I imagine it creates a lot of internal harmony between like 
even subconsciously the things that matter to you and the things that you care about and then the things that you're doing within your business, right? That yep. it creates this alignment where you don't feel like you're working in somebody else's business, but it's it's really a reflection of you, especially if you're the founder, the owner, the one running mm -hmm. it. And yep. your business gets to take on the personality that you intentionally create for it. And so having that alignment, I imagine, would, would lead to being much more engaged with the work you're doing, more excited about the things that you're doing, not waking up on Monday dreading the fact that you got to go back to work, you know, right. and, and just overall, I mean, that's, that's the whole reason if you're an entrepreneur, like you started and created your own thing in the first place is because you wanted to make something from yourself. Totally. And yeah. so, so being able to have that, that alignment and doing the work to clearly identify, these are really the, the non-negotiables for me yep. within my business and how I approach my business. Uh, I mean, I can only imagine all the positive downstream effects of that for everything that you do. And it's, it, you also, in addition to what those things, what the, all those things you just said, Travis is like, you get more excited because you're attracting people who align with your values now, because there are people who would say, no, I don't know. I don't align with Rick. Like, okay, cool. That's, I'm totally fine with that. And I will say that this is harder. I will, I will say this, this can be harder for somebody who's early in their business because at that point they feel like I got to take anything and everything to grow my business. And I get that, but I would encourage you to really try to, if number one, if you don't have values, like set those up, figure out what those are, and then try as much as possible to really be integral with your values so that you are building the business through the lens of your values. And you're not just taking anything and everything and I get that. I know that. And I used to do that too, right? Because you're like, I got I to gotta make money in my business. I get it. And so it's easy for me to sit here after eight and a half years in a successful business of like, oh, I just, you know, I pick and choose. I get that it's easy to do that. But my business completely shifted when we were very intentional about the values. And if I could have done it earlier on, absolutely, I would have done that. So I'd be remiss if we went through a whole podcast interview and we didn't talk about your podcast, which has been around for a considerably longer amount of time than this one <laughs> <laughs> since it's, it's just launching. Um, talk to me a little bit about how that has shifted for you and, and in light of you know that value-centric exploration that you've gone through and the pivots that you've made there, but also just how podcasting and the landscape of podcasting has shifted. Um, you know, how, how has the art of online business continued to evolve and even before we started recording, we were talking about some different ideas and things you're, you're yeah. kicking around to try and innovate within it. Is, is the podcast still the number one driver for, for yep. your business right now? Yep, it is. Yeah, we, we saw, I mean, the, the podcast, I'm really grateful for, for what the show has done. Um, I was telling somebody the other day, I've actually been podcasting now for nine years. Like, I started my first podcast in 2013 and it was, I did it for 52 episodes. And then in, uh, I believe it was January, I think it was of 2015 is when I started what is now the podcast is this podcast. But at the time it was called the art of paid traffic. And it was, it was the first podcast that was all about paid traffic and Facebook ads and stuff like that. And then obviously others came along and that's great. And it did really, really well. It was very fortunate where great downloads, a lot of people all over the world listening to it and, you know, talking about shifting and making a change about at this point, probably three years ago, I renamed it to the art of online business because I was expanding on, I can still, I can still teach Facebook ads to anybody. Right. And it's still very much a part of what I do, but I don't specifically do that. And so when I made that sort of expansion in the business, I changed the name to the art of online business. And it's been, I mean, we're, what's today? Tuesday, tomorrow, I think we publish like episode like 626 or something. And uh, we're hitting 9 million downloads of the podcast this summer, total in total. And so, I mean, I'm really grateful for the show and I love this format. I think how it's evolved is, you know, I, there was pretty much no competition nine years ago, and now everybody and their brother has a podcast. 
And so it's harder to stand out. You have all the big names coming. You have big brands coming in. You have celebrities starting their shows because they finally understand the, the opportunity that exists with podcasting, which you've been talking about for a long time. And so just like you said, we were talking before we hit record, like some ideas about how to, I'm always looking for what can be done differently within the scope of an episode. Because, you know, I like most people do interviews. You know, I do two episodes a week, a Wednesday episode and a Friday episode. I like to think that I was one of the first people to do a quick tip episode and now I see a whole bunch of people doing it, but I won't take credit for that by any means. <laughs> but it's a shorter episode, right? So it's like Wednesday is my full length episode, whether you know, it's like an hour, 45 minutes to an hour where it's either a solo episode with me or I do an interview. Friday episode is what I call a quick tip where I talk about one specific thing for like 15, 20 minutes. Originally, it was supposed to be like 10 minutes and I'm bringing it back down because it got longer. And it does really, really well. Now, I think the innovation part are the different things that you can do within episodes. You know, I think one trend is people are loving the shorter episodes, like 10 minutes long. Um, And then, you know, so like and just doing different things within the episode. The other big evolution, if you will, is video. So we're on video right now. We're both recording. Um, And so... It wasn't until November of 2021, so where are we, August, so 10 months ago, 11 months ago, um, 10 months, whatever it was, <laughs> nine months ago, uh, I started doing video where I just basically turned on my camera like I'm on right now on this, you know, on my podcasting mic, and this is how I record my podcast episodes, whether it's obviously an interview or solo, and you know, we were talking about earlier before we hit record, YouTube finally has a podcasting section now to choose from in the Explorer section. So it's been rumored for a long time that YouTube is getting into the second largest search engine. Let's get in on the quote ground floor of doing podcast videos on YouTube. Um, but then also the the leverage that you create when you do a video podcast, meaning I can cut these up into social media snippets. Um, I can do little clip videos on the YouTube channel. The, the opportunities like TikTok, Instagram reels, Instagram stories, all that different types of stuff that you can do. And that's, you know, the really, I think the biggest innovation, I think that people who aren't doing video along with their, with their audio podcast, they really need to, if they're going to take, continue to take it seriously. So it's been fun to watch what's happening here in the plat in you know in, in the in the space over the past few years. Yeah, I, I definitely second that. Video is used to be a luxury. It's like, hey, if you can throw some video on there, now it's becoming more of a necessity, not just because of platforms like YouTube, but simply because you you can take, like you said, one recording, one interview, and then now you have the opportunity to repurpose it in so many different places if you're looking for efficient ways to create content for your business video podcast is the easiest one to start and the easiest one to scale because you can take that same piece of content that you know if you're just creating like a how-to video on youtube that doesn't necessarily translate to an audio only format or to a micro clip somewhere else but a video podcast is so versatile uh and it's relatively easy to turn on a camera while you're recording that I think it really is a great opportunity. And the faster that people hop onto that, the quicker they'll be yep. able to catch the wave. It took me a while. It took me a couple weeks to get used to being on camera and doing and doing um, the you know like doing the actual episode. But one thing I realized is that you look at other people who do video podcasts, and it's not like they're looking at the camera the whole time. <laughs> You know, they're looking off and they're looking at the person or they're looking at the screen or what have you, and they're talking. And so it was that little tip that kind of like calmed me down, if you will. And again, I've been podcasting for at that time for eight years. So it's not like it was my first episode, but I've been doing audio for all those years. And then I add video in and it was kind of weird at first. But then when I realized and I, 
you know, like, all right, I don't have to be looking at the camera. And that's really kind of weird, right? The whole time. <laughs> <You're> like, uh. <laughs> but you are, you know, you can be looking around, you can be looking at your notes. It's okay. And, but people, a lot of people prefer to watch podcasts these days. But yeah, I mean, in the leveraging part, like repurposing, you get the opportunities are endless. Blog posts, social media posts, video clips, you name it, it's there. So I've got two more questions before we wrap up. Uh, but first, where's the best place for people to connect with you? Where can they find the podcast? Um, if they're a course creator or have a membership and they're at a place where they, they feel like coaching and mentorship would really help them get to the next level, what's the best place for them to go to learn more about Accelerator and see if they'd be a good fit for that? Yeah, thanks for that. It would be rickmulready.com forward slash accelerator. Uh, has all the information about the program and so forth. Uh, the podcast is The Art of Online Business, where wherever podcasts are sold now, wherever podcasts <laughs> are listened to, all the platforms. And the best way to connect with me would probably just two ways. You can shoot me an email. Rick at rickmulready.com is my, is my email address. And, um, or you can shoot me a DM over on Instagram. I'm at Rick Mulready. Wonderful. All right. So you've been in the digital marketing, marketing game for quite a while. And while you've seen a lot of best practices, I imagine you've also come across a lot of just horrific advice. Is there any particular piece of marketing advice that comes to <laughs> mind is like, I really hope no one does this because that would be catastrophic. Just like a like yes. an absolutely horrendous bad piece of advice. Yeah, two right <laughs> off the bat. Yeah. Number one, don't create your course before selling it. Amen to that. Like <laughs> it has been said for years, like, oh no, create your course and then find your audience and all this other. No, 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 no. Don't spend all of, I'm going through this literally right now with a couple of our accelerator members where they're creating some new offers. Okay, great. Validate it first, right? So make sure people want to buy it before you spend all this time creating content, setting up, you know, your, your um, course platform software, whatever it might be. So that's number one. What you, do, what you need to do there is what are you teaching? What is the promise? Like when someone goes through this course, what are they going to come away with? And then you do want to kind of an outline of what's going to be in the program. That's it. That's all you need and a price, right? That's what you take to your audience. And you're like, all right, I'm accepting X many people here's the credit card, you know, here's the order form. I mean, sign up. And then nothing's going to light a fire about course creation until when you get people waiting, like they paid you money and they're waiting for it. So that's number one. Um, I would say number two, and I see this all the time and it like, I just don't get it. People build this custom platform. Like they build this customized thing that they work with a developer on. And again, it happens oftentimes in conjunction with not having validated the offer. And I cringe because I'm like, you're spending so many thousands of dollars to build this customized thing when there's so many different platforms like we just mentioned earlier, like 10X Pro or Kajab, whatever it might be, they have built in things that are enough to get you going and then you can evolve from there. And I would say the last little thing is you don't need a fancy website or anything like that to have a very successful business. We did seven figures in the first four years. And I don't say that a brag or anything. I'm just saying like we did, we're able to accomplish that back when I thought that was what success meant. And we had the worst site in the world. And I even had the worst site in the world until November of 2021. <laughs> <laughs> so that's not, or 2020, excuse me. Yeah. That's less than two years ago, and I've been doing this eight and a half years, just kind of gives you a sense of like, it's not about fancy or anything like that. So, so you asked for one, I gave you three. That's all right. C connect with the person you're trying to serve, understand them deeply, and yeah. then solve a problem that they have. And then all the other pieces Pretty basic. fall into place, right? Yeah. <laughs> right. It's not easy. I mean, that principle, those principles are easy. It's not easy to do it because if, if it were, everyone would do it, but it really comes down to those principles right there. Yep. Still got to execute. Still got to execute. Yep. And then my, exactly. la my last question, if you, if you think back to eight and a half years ago, when you left the corporate world, started your entrepreneurial journey, 
knowing everything that you know now, what would you tell yourself on day one? Like, what's the piece of advice you would share with your past self, knowing mm. what you know now to really set you on the trajectory that you would hope to have gone on? Or if it's exactly where you are, what have, what's led you to this point? I think that I don't think I would change anything as far as what I've done. I would, well, I mean, no, it kind of, all, all the things happen for a reason. I would change the mindset though. I would say, where do I know the answer to this right off the bat. I would say, basically chill the F out. It's going to be okay. And that you always figure things out. That's what I would, that is what I would tell myself back then. Cause I've, you know, I struggled with anxiety. I talked about it a lot in the podcast, struggled with anxiety for years since I was a little kid. And like when you, I was in the corporate world and you, you, you know, you leave a quote unquote secure job to build your own business so many people think that that's more risky and that's a whole other conversation. But like my anxiety really ramped up when I left the corporate world. And so I would go back and tell myself, number one, get a coach sooner. And number two, it's going to be okay. You always figure things out. Awesome. Thank you so yep. much, Rick, for everything. You bet, man. Thanks for having me on. So I hope you enjoyed that conversation as much as I did recording it. My number one takeaway from my conversation with Rick is don't forget who your ideal customer is. It is so important to overlook those basic details of who am I serving? What are their problems? What are their felt needs? How can I really make a positive impact and a positive difference in their life? It's so easy to become detached from that, removed from that, lose connection to the people that we're helping and serving with our businesses. Don't be afraid to consistently come back to that and say, okay, let's, let's make sure we're still messaging in a way that connects and resonates with the people we're trying to serve. Let's go back and revisit the website. Let's go back and revisit our ad campaign. Let's go back and revisit our about page, whatever it is, and make sure that you are consistently communicating to the people that you're trying to reach so you attract the customers that your business is designed to help. Now, if you are a course creator or if you have a paid membership program and you feel like you're stuck, you feel like you need some coaching, some guidance to get you to that next level, I cannot recommend enough Rick's Accelerator program. Uh, I mentioned at the beginning of the interview, uh, I've had, I had the privilege of being in there for a full year and there are so many things that I can trace back in my own entrepreneurial journey and connect to my time there that have led to where I am today. And I truly believe I wouldn't be where I am without Rick's mentorship in that program. So if that is you, I definitely encourage you to check it out. It's, I believe, rickmolderready.com slash accelerator. The link will be in the show notes if you want to check that out. And also make sure to go and check out his podcast as well, The Art of Online Business, where he talks about all things related to growing as an entrepreneur, online businesses, strategies, tactics, has some phenomenal guests on there. And uh, definitely in my top 10 podcasts to listen to as a business owner and marketer. Well, I hope you enjoyed this episode of the Honest Marketing Podcast. And as always, be honest. Yeah.